can go home at a decent time. We're going to go ahead and start. Before I pass it to Mary, I do want to remind you there is also a California difference you need to be aware of. Okay. Maximum fluoro dose, according to the feds, is what? Ten. Okay. okay. Maximum in in boost is twenty. Twenty. California typical exposure or maximum exposure for a typical patient is five. That's a California rule. It's not national. It's a California rule, and that's what we're held to. Does anybody know what a typical patient is? 70 kilogram adult male. Uh, how many ounces? It's about seven and seven eighths inches of lucite. What? What? I'm just telling you. This is what you know. I, I don't make the rules, but that's California. Seven and seven eighths inches of lucite. The state comes in. They measure using that phantom. Cannot exceed five R in normal mode. Normal mode is defined as the default setting of the image intensifier. So it's the largest mode. That's considered normal. Everything else is considered mag. So it's in normal mode, 7, 7, 8 inch of lucite has to five, be under 5. Okay? Maximum is still 10. Okay, so that's a California rule. I don't know if, it, you know, I don't know because we never get feedback because it's illegal for anybody that takes ART to give us feedback about how much California stuff is on that test or not. Who knows? But just to make sure you're aware of it, California also requires, well, that's all right, that's during QA. All right, excuse me. Barry, all yours. Thank you for, make sure you eat, guys, please. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to take them home. <laughs> I have to eat. <laughs> okay, that's not too dark. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate you uh, staying over a little bit. Um, uh, the idea behind all this was I usually present this in uh, like early uh, September or right before you're about the time you're ready to start in the fall. Uh, but I was kind of holding off because I'm trying to uh, arrange for a radiologist to come to the class and do some presentations of, you know, things that they see or common mistakes, uh, things that we could do better, uh, you know, because a lot of times you don't really get a whole lot of feedback from the uh, from the doctors. So I got the, I did talk with our uh, uh, medical advisor, but he might not be ready for a couple weeks or maybe until maybe in the early spring. So I thought, let me go ahead and just get this out to you. I know a lot of you have had, we're going to go over a little bit of the, uh, quite a bit on the surgery. I know a lot of you have had it, some of you haven't. So I'll, I'll kind of go through it a little bit quicker than I normally would because I don't want to bore people with that. Uh, so the things we'll cover a little bit here. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be sending all of this to you, okay? I've got, you know, PowerPoints and I've got some uh, notes in that. So if you want to take notes, that's fine. You don't have to, because I'll send you all the stuff. Um, and so I've got some uh, PowerPoints on patient care. <clears throat> the main reason I'm going over the patient care is that you're going to have, with your nursing skills uh, evaluation, they're going to ask you stuff about vital signs, so just knowing what those are. And then also for like contrast reactions, you'll need to know that for your uh, CT uh, evaluation. So, you know, those are the things that we'll cover. But like I said, there's a lot of it that you'll be able to just look at it on your own, so I'm not gonna take the time out. <clears throat> but the other thing I'm gonna do is I've got all kinds of stuff on the techniques. Uh, because I know uh, uh, the last couple of years, um, uh, people have been, we've been asking everyone to put techniques in their positioning chart. And it's really, I know it looks like it's a lot of work, and it is, don't get me wrong, but having to put techniques was even that much more work. But the thing is, when I saw what people would put down as techniques, I could see the common mistakes that people were made. And Dr. Frianeza did a great job in going over that, but there's a transition between when you learn it in class and then when you get to clinical, and it's sometimes something's lost. So I just wanted to make sure that we went over those things. It was, it was good that I saw what the mistakes were. They were the same ones every year. 
So, like I said, I've got um, some notes here, and I'll send you a copy of that, okay? And I'll put it up here, okay? <clears throat> uh, just as a side note, so in a couple weeks, we've got the case studies due. So let me know if you have any questions. Just go by the rubric, and you should be fine. You know, it, it's, it's really, they're really pretty easy in that, okay? Don't knock yourself out to try to find the most unusual case, just some simple fracture or situation, some pathology, okay? So it's just a learning experience. It's not to, you know, unearth the, you know, a Nobel Peace Prize win, okay? So don't, don't, don't go crazy over it, okay? You got more important things to do. All right, um, so I wanted just to um, talk about just a couple of the, the different PowerPoints. Um, the first couple, I'm just gonna show you real quick. I'm not gonna go into any more detail. It's just the things to know about consent. Those are things important, especially knowing that they, they can be revoked at any time and the entire form has to be filled out. There can't be any blanks to that. Uh, immobilization devices. Uh, let me see if I can paste through it a little bit easier. Any kind of things about codes, ergonomics, things to, to, um, to uh, understand with that. Race and past, kind of important to learn that, okay? So that pretty much covers uh, the first unit here. Let me go over and pull out uh, unit two here. And again, we're not gonna really, just know about the cycle of infection and be familiar with you know, you know, direct contact and indirect contact and what's a fomite, what's a vector, droplet, airborne, the difference between those. Uh, you know, there's some interesting stuff about hepatitis B, everyone. Well, years ago, we were so concerned about AIDS. It's really hep B that you need to be concerned about, okay? It's much more, it's able to survive outside the body of that. It's a big, kind of a big deal. There's your three uh, nosocomial infections to really uh, follow that. Um, different guidelines, you know, again, some more different precautions. So you can look through that. I don't wanna really take the time out of that to do that. Uh, let's see, on this one here, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over, these are, again, for emergency, medical emergencies and that. Um, Certainly being familiar with uh, a number of the shocks, but the main one, of course, is your anaphylactic. And this is where you'll be quizzed uh, for your uh, CT uh, um, evaluation. So you do want to know this. The, whole, the key of all the vital signs is really the blood pressure. And in every vital sign of every uh, type of uh, shock, it's always the blood pressure that drops. So that's the one that you really need to, uh, to be aware of. Um, you always want to consider all these different, you know, uh, considerations and contraindications, you know, whether they're, you know, uh, they're diabetic or they have any kind of liver function uh, uh, issue or renal, especially if the patient's on dialysis, knowing how to sequence it. You always want to give the dialysis, you always want to give the contrast before they get dialyzed, before that. Otherwise, it sits in their system for maybe a couple of days, that doesn't do any good, okay? So if you need to bring someone down, see if you can do it before they get their dialysis treatment. That's kind of a key thing with that. Um, just some general information about iodine and contrast reactions. You know, it's just some good information to know. Keep in mind that, you know, when you do some kind of contrast study, that there is expected side effects and then there's adverse side effects. So the expected side effects, warm flush feeling, funny metallic taste, it's good to communicate that with the patient. Other than that, you don't have to note anything. You know, they'll be like, it'll be just kind of interesting, okay? And it usually passes real quickly. Of course, the ones we have to be more concerned with are the mild, moderate, and severe reactions. So just understand some of those. Has anyone ever seen anyone that had a vasovagal reaction? So again, that's not a reaction from the contrast. It's a reaction to the anxiety of the procedure. They could be injecting saline and they would still have the same reaction as they might even with you know some of the contrast in that. So just kind of understanding a little bit what uh, happens with that. And again, with the different reactions, so do you know be a little bit familiar with some of these. I've got small hives here and you know giant hives. So there's a difference, you know, when it talks about uh, difficulty breathing or patient complaints of throat closing. They think that might, what might be happening is there's hives actually in the trachea that's closing off the lumen and it's making it difficult for the patient to breathe. So uh, they don't know why it causes these reactions, but just understand that. 
service of emergency treatment. You know, they may need to get an airway going, you know, putting in a, a trach, epinephrine, or adrenaline. Again, it's a vasoconstrictor because guess what? Which is the vital sign, remember? It's, it's blood pressure, and they've got to raise that. So they'll use, use that to raise the blood pressure. Also, what this does, helps out sometimes, along with albuterol, is you get bronchospasms. So the bronchial tree starts closing up. They can't breathe, so it dilates those bronchial uh, openings to that so a patient can breathe a little bit better. So those are some of the main ones uh, to learn. Um, yeah, it's just some information about diabetes and that. You can look at that. Um, you know, what's interesting, I, I've got a couple little uh, things on this here. Uh, if they're cold and clammy, give them candy, okay? So that's kind of a, a cute little way of remembering, you know, so that way we give them candy or fruit juice if, they're, if their uh, blood sugar is low in that, okay? All right. Um, there's some information on seizures and syncope. So here's, you know, again, just the, you know, the normal ranges for temperature, the normal pulse for adults. Again, that's normal for society, not for each of us, okay? And so that's what that range is there. If it's high or low, it's tachycardia and bradycardia. Um, there's sites for uh, detect, uh, you know, for pulse. And then respiration is just 15 to 20 here. So the blood pressure is, again, the key one. So this is gonna be your normal range. Your systolic is gonna be 90 to 120. Your diastolic is gonna be 50 to 70. So if you have high blood pressure, everything rises as a unit. Both of these numbers will rise here. If you have low blood pressure, everything lowers as a unit. It doesn't mean that the, the range expands, everything as a unit goes down. Does that make sense? Okay, so just kind of wanted to show you on that. Whenever you have, you know, now you'll be able to look a little bit uh, better at some of the monitors and you can see, you know, like you go to a patient's room, you want to sit the patient up, you can look at the blood pressure and say, oh boy, that's low, maybe I need to check. You always want to check anyway before you set them up, but maybe if it's low, it'd be like, oh, this would not be a good candidate to set them up, okay? So you have a little bit of understanding of what those numbers mean and it'll help you out quite a bit, okay? Um, in terms of um, renal function, BUN and creatinine, so you remember those, and anything that's, um, that's elevated on one of those can be, doesn't necessarily mean it will be, but it can be a contraindication to uh, whether you give the exam or not, okay? Uh, white blood cell count, uh, just a normal range is 3,500 to 10,500. So what happens, uh, we'll go into this whole detail, people in my patient care class know about this, is that a lot of times the nurses, instead of telling you you know, necessarily what's wrong with the patient, they'll just say, you know, their white blood cell count is 30,000. It's up to you to know, oh, is that a high number or a low number? So instead of saying the patient has an infection, they'll give you either, you know, their, their reading or they'll say, you know, we gave them this medication. And instead of saying that they're nausea, nausea you know, they, they, we're giving them this medication. It's for you to understand, you know, they talk to us like we're nurses and we're not. So kind of understand. So it does help to know some of the different values of that. Uh, with platelets, you know, just being familiar a little bit, what you might have heard of PT and PTT. So knowing those are the uh, INR. So that's some of the different ones that they use. Um, and that's pretty much it for, uh, for that unit. Uh, the fourth one here, let me go over this here, uh, in terms of uh, drug administration. So um, just understanding here a little bit about IV pumps, it's important to know what the word patent means. You've heard that? So, you know, if you call up a floor, one of the best things to do is call the floor up and find out, hey, how's this, uh, Mr. Jones, we're bringing him down for a contrast study. How's this IV? Oh, it's patent. Oh, that's fine, but is it open? You know, so patent means open, okay? So, you know, if you call them and say, yeah, I just want to check, is this line patent? They're going, oh, we're talking to a pro here. They didn't know the terms of that. So, that's an important one to learn. Ever go down to the ER and you see someone getting a breathing treatment? So yeah, leave them, leave them alone. You know, I would hate it if I had a, uh, you know, a, a put a cassette behind them and someone came up to a respiratory therapist, came up and put one of those tubes in their mouth, okay? So when they're getting their breathing treatment, they can, I've seen people do that where they try to take a chest x-ray behind them. They're not supposed to be taking in a big breath. That's their medication. So that's just understand what a breathing treatment is. Um, you've all seen a pulse ox. In terms of if a patient needs oxygen, 
if you're going to use a cannula, one to four liters is safe. Okay. If they have a face mask, it needs to be five liters. It needs to be more than five liters. Okay. Uh, NG tubes and that, so you understand. Just to going over that. Uh, I know uh, a good friend over at Saddleback wanted me to make sure everyone understands about pay tubes and that. The G tubes and the pay tubes can be put in in surgery, but you want to make sure these pay tubes can actually be, re the revision can occur in radiology. So you'll see that occasionally in our department in that, okay? I don't really need to go through central lines too much, pick lines and porta caths here. Um, understand that you know, whenever we have a patient that's undergoing some kind of um, uh, assisted ventilation, they may have a trach in there, they may have an ET tube, or have you ever had, well, you'll see this more in the evening, where you ever, ever heard the term bagging the patient? We actually have to help with the ventilation when you transform, transport them down. So, you know, that's something you'll see again, more on evenings than that. So, you know, with the trach, just be real careful, the patient's really aware of everything. It's uh, not held in place by very much, so make sure that you're, you're careful with that. ET tube, a lot of times, we're having to take a chest x-ray and making sure that that's in the right placement. Uh, and the ventilator stays on, you just need to time your, your chest x-ray at the right point. Um, and then the ambu bag, again, this is when we bag the patient as we bring them down to, uh, to the department, or bring them back up, okay? Um, chest tubes, this is kind of an underrated one, and this is what we're talking about here. These devices always have to remain upright. Uh, I found one thing that's easy. If you put it on the floor, or on, on a, on those, uh, usually it's on the floor, just take down these ends so it stays upright. Uh, but, you know, this is really more important than, you know, than an EG, EG tube or a ventilator, you know, making sure that that doesn't get disconnected or they'll have a collapsed lung. And depending on where the tube is entering the patient will tell you what the problem is. So if the tube is inserted in the upper anterior part of the chest, that means they're trying to draw air out. It's a collapsed lung. If it's in the lower back part, it means there's fluid and they're trying to draw the fluid out, okay? So you can always see where it's located as to what to do. And then for suctioning, just making sure that your room always has a suction canister. And remember this from the, the, the dentist, the Yankier devices, you have to have those in place, okay? Or they have to be uh, ready to go, okay? And that's pretty much it for that. Let me go ahead and uh, talk about uh, the uh, techniques in that. I want to spend, I'd rather spend a little more time going over that. So, you know, um, I, you know, talked to uh, uh, Pon. Uh, a couple weeks ago and she said, yeah, you may need to make sure that everyone's actually trying to put together a technique book. It really is important uh, because again, you go up to surgery, you're on your portables, having a good idea as to what the techniques are will really help you out in that. Always want to get a baseline for an average person and then you can try to figure out, you know, or base, be, better to even take x-rays on someone thick or thin to get an idea of you know, what the different range is. But if you have a, a thin, average, and thick technique for a particular view, that's really all you need, okay? Um, so if you ever have to, you know, like in some places, if you want to do a manual technique for like, let's say an upright abdomen, and you used to do it at 40 inches, you want to do the 72 inches, I found what's really easy, you just take the, whatever the technique at 40 inches, and just multiply it by about two and a half to three. So if you do an upright abdomen at 40 inches, uh, you know, maybe it's a 40, 40 mass, if you need to do it at 72 inches, it'd be like 100 to 120 mass. And that usually was in the ballpark pretty well, okay? Um, when you, um, um, in terms of uh, from going from, you know, your upper extremities and lower extremities, as you go uh, towards the midline, Obviously, your techniques need to increase. I know it sounds pretty basic to say that, but I would notice in technique charts, you know, people would sometimes have a technique for an elbow that would be less than for a forearm. No, it needs to go up, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, when, this is something that I'm gonna talk about with surgery a little bit. Sometimes you have to play an association game to be able to figure out some techniques. So I have this situation where 
It was a short time, a couple weeks after I graduated, and we're bringing a one-year-old down for an abdomen. I had no idea what technique to use. And so the tech I was working with was so good, he said, think about another body part that's about this big that you do all the time. And I thought, wow, I said, my knees, is, there you go. Just use a knee technique. And we did, and it came out great. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing a baby femur, you might want to use, like, a wrist technique. It's about the same thickness. So that's something that really helped me out uh, quite a bit, all right? Oh, sorry. Um, I want to kind of talk about this because I mentioned this to a couple people. So if you know the answer, don't yell it out. So sometimes you want to do a cone down. Let's say you're used to, you're doing a waters view and you want to do nasal bones. So you just want to get this area. So you're coning it down from a 10 by 12 to maybe a four by four light field, okay? When you go ahead and cone it down, do you need to use less technique, the same technique, or more technique? So who thinks you need to use less? Because you're going down, okay? Who thinks you use the same? Who thinks you need to go up? You need to go up, okay? And the reason is because when you're using a smaller light field like this, you're basically eliminating all of the scatter that would have attributed to the density. It's like using a, it's like using a grid. When you go to a, from a non-grid to a grid, you've got to go up in your technique, right? So, you know, like go up four times in your mass. It's the same idea. So you go from a 10 by 12 light field to a small light field like that, like we're going from a regular waters to a cone down for the nasal bones, you need to go up in your technique. Does that make sense? A lot of people think you go down because you're using a smaller field. Actually, you need to go up quite a bit more. That happened to me. I used the same technique. It was like, why is this so light? And I realized, oh boy, I'm gonna have to double it. And then it came out fine. I was like, yeah, because you've eliminated all of the scatter that would have contributed to the density. Make sense? Okay. Uh, there's a number of different groups of things that'll utilize the same techniques. And this is the same things that I saw on the charts. You know, I'd see someone have a lateral C-spine technique, and the cross-table lateral was very different. It's like, it's the same part. It's not going to change whether they're upright or lateral. When you're doing a spot or a lateral sacrum coccyx, it's about the same technique. You know, of course, a knee and a patella would be the same. But this is an interesting one. A lot of people say, so what do I use for swimmers? What do I use for a cross-table lateral hip? That crazy old technique that you hear about, the 80 at 80, it's not that crazy. It actually works a lot of times. It's a little bit of a variation, but you know, something like, you know, like, you know, maybe a swimmers, and I've got some techniques I'll show you. You know, just so maybe a little bit less KV and a little less mass, but it'll work. But the swimmers, the cross table lateral hip, and you rarely ever do a trans thoracic lateral, but that's about the same technique, okay? And so just kind of keep those in mind. Whenever you're doing like a calcaneus, we'll go over it. Uh, when people would put down the techniques for the calcaneus for the plantar dorsal or the lateral, they use the same technique. Uh uh, it's not the same. If you're going to do a lateral calcaneus or a lateral foot or a lateral ankle, they're going to be in the same neighborhood. It's about the same thickness, okay? But when you do your plantar dorsal, I'll talk about that in a little bit, it's quite a bit different technique. AP shoulder, AP clavicle, AP scapula, it's about the same, okay? Um, a, uh, uh, AP pelvis, sacrum, AP coccyx, the oblique, L, uh, SI joints is the same. So a lot of times, if I did an AP sacrum and it came out good, whenever I would go to the AP coccyx, I would take it off of the AEC because I know it can pretty much use the same technique. It's gonna come out to be about the same, all right? In general, shoulder and knee techniques are pretty similar. Okay, uh, I found that the APC spine and even the dens, it's not going to vary that much. Okay, uh, even when you go from an AP hip to a frog hip, it's about really it's kind of about the same. All right, so um, when what people have asked like for a wide view, what, and again these are just suggestions. You know your place makes you a little bit hotter or lighter. And again, it's just a rough idea. But from your AP shoulder technique, you might want to go up about 10 kV and maybe a step or two in mass, and that should probably get you in the neighborhood. A lot of times people say, oh, they shot it, it's like, oh, it's grainy, or whatever. Well, they use AEC, and again, you have to be really good with your, with your positioning to do it. Sometimes if you have an idea what to set, 
that might be the better idea, okay? Uh, have you done that many AC joints? Has anyone ever done anyone, any of them? Okay, all right, so all you have to do for, keep in mind, because when people would put in the technique chart, AC joint, they'd use the same technique as an AP shoulder. Well, it would be the same, it's just that you're not using the same distance. And with AP shoulder, you're using a 40 inch sit. With the, with the uh, AC joint, you're using a 72 inch sit. So again, all you have to do is take whatever you would use for your AP shoulder and keep the KD the same but take the mass value for your AP shoulder, and again, just multiply it by two and a half to three because you're just accounting for the distance. Make sense? And then you'll be fine with that, okay? It's just using the inverse square law. Uh, for ribs, <clears throat> in general, for your upper ribs, you want to use between 60 and 70 kV on inspiration. For the low ribs, just use an abdomen technique. That's it, whatever, whatever that person you would shoot an abdomen on, just do that, okay? and put the bottom of the light field or bottom of the cassette a little bit above the top of the crash and you'll be fine. For that calcaneus, we're talking about that plantar dorsal, because you're using a 40 degree tube angle towards the heel, you need to use a lot more KV than that, than you normally for a lateral. Like a lateral calcaneus might be what, 60 at two, 60 at three, something like that. You're gonna have to use a lot more KV because it's going through a, a greater part this is at an angle. It's not going through, you know, the heel. It's going through almost the entire foot, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, for your, again, spine work, a lot of my C-spines, I, I generally just use manual technique. It's not like a lumbar where you get a great variation between people. People's necks, it's not that many settings that you need. So if you feel a little more comfortable using a manual setting, then I think you'll have more consistent results. Um, and again, here's the swimmers. Again, it's not that different than that 80 at 80. It's somewhere in that neighborhood. But again, your place may shoot just a little bit different than that. For a Fuchs, this is what I use to use. Uh, so you'll get an idea here. Uh, this was interesting. When I looked at people's uh, floral numbers, what they would set as the KV, sometimes for different studies, they put like 75 KV they were using for flora. It's like, no, it's 105, okay? So just keep that in mind. For barium, it's for that. If you're using high paint, it might be about 90 kV. And here's just some overhead values if you were gonna take some overheads for an esophagram or an upper GI in that. Um, the only other notes here, I said for, like when you're doing it a cube abdomen, you're looking for free air, so it'd probably be a good idea to go down a step or two from your setting for your KUB, because you don't wanna burn out the air. And that's the thing on that one. Uh, if you ever do sternum, here's some sternum techniques. You probably never need it. And we'll go over cast techniques. We went over that today a little bit, so I adjusted the techniques a little bit. So, you know, again, these are what work for me, but again, it's more for film, so it may be needing to be tweaked a little bit, but of course, as you go up, you know, the fiberglass cast isn't as thick as that dry plaster, and the warm plaster has water retention. It's like they have edema. So you have to go up even more in that, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so does that make a little sense? So I'll send you a copy of that uh, today in that, all right? So uh, let me go ahead and close out of this here, and let me go over some of this here, and like I said, I'll try to be uh, pretty quick with it. Um, so um, uh, um, let's see, one of the things that you certainly want to understand is, have you ever heard of something, they need to flash something? So if something drops on the floor, they're gonna to need to get it sterilized, so that's the steam under pressure, but better known mm -hmm. as autoclaving or just flash. Hey, someone needs to flash it. That's what they're talking about with that, okay? <clears throat> um, here's all the stuff about the different protocols. With the surgery team, this is kind of interesting. So, you know, here's all the uh, people, up. there's another slide on this, uh, but there are two people that you really wanna become their new, your new best friends in that. One of them would be either the anesthesiologist or the nurse anesthetist. Again, that's the one that's registering, making sure the ventilation is working properly. They can help you out so much with things. Helping you out when you come in the room, you know, the patient's draped, you're shooting a cross table lateral lumbar, you have no idea what technique to use. They can say, oh yeah, oh yeah, he's 6'2", 180. That gives you an idea of how big they are. Don't just go by weight, you gotta go by height too. Because if they weigh 180 and they're five feet, versus 6'3", it's gonna be a different body habitus, okay? Uh, and also they can help you even positioning the C-arm 
when you're coming in, they're at the head end of the table, and we're at the worst position at the side, which is really hard sometimes to see how far in or out you need to go, and sometimes it can say, yeah, move in a little bit, that sounds great. So, just as a side note, has, you know, the people that have been up in surgery, has there been music in the room? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Some doctors like music, some doctors don't like music, okay? So when you get to know the doctors that like music and that, you can tell how the case is going before you go in the room. If you go in the room, I mean, if, if, when you're gonna go in the room and they like music and it's really loud, things are going well, okay? If you're about to enter the room and things are silent, things have gone south. Just keep in mind, that's not the time you come in and say, hey, I got a good joke. You know, it's like, you know, there's something that's wrong. When, there's, when anything goes wrong, they shut the music off. And one of the disc jockeys in the room could be that anesthesiologist or the nurse anesthetist, okay? <clears throat> the other one to keep that you want to be good friends with is that circulating nurse. Because again, they can help you out with a lot of things, whatever you need, and don't be hesitant to help them. A lot of times, have you ever seen these big microscopes they use for like laminectomies? They're a couple hundred pounds. Help them, get on your knees and help them push that. You will get paid back tenfold from that. Because people, huh? What's this? All right, so help them out and they will help you out in return, okay? All right, uh, obviously you can see we don't get near this area unless it's the end of the case, okay? They're watching you like a hawk. So there's kind of a line here, you don't see it. They can come over on our side, but we cannot go over anything close to their side, okay? Uh, let's talk about this here. Uh, so it uh, talks about, you know, confidence. You know, just know when you go up to surgery, it's kind of like an initiation. They kind of want you to fail a little bit so you let so they let you know who's boss okay and you never fight them and so you know i've made plenty of little mistakes and they kind of like that and if you just you know learn from it you'll be fine but just know that you're going to make mistakes okay and not you know just make small ones okay um so mastery it talks about here mastery of all aspects so um you know uh, again trying to get as much information as you can like, you know, you've you got a patient, they're all draped, you need a technique, ask the nurse anesthetist, you know, can you give me a height and weight on them? So at least you get an idea of what technique to use. Problem solving. This is probably the most important one because OR is trauma, all right? And we need to really kind of think on our feet as to what kind of angle to use, you know, where everything goes. Sometimes the doctors, the surgeons may not help out as much, okay? And one of the things, again, you want to play that game of association when you can't figure something out. So let me give you a for instance. <clears throat> um, had a, 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 a worked on in the evening when I first started, and one of the guys came down from surgery, said, yeah, I had a shoot up. They wanted a cross, they wanted a, man, a lateral mandible. I said, God, what 